Otherwise, this meeting's over. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so I gave you a folder, and we'll, we'll get to play with it shortly. Just a little bit, how many of you have heard of ATP before? What have you heard? What have I heard? Yeah, who are we? Just to him. Oh, just what he said. <laughs> we are uh, based in Oak Bluff, Manitoba. We had to do some expansions on our production facility up to about, so we can now produce about 40 million acres, uh, 40 million liters production facility. Everything is fairly state-of-the-art, blah, 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 rah, rah. We are fantastic. The most agronomically complete product offering in the market. We have everything from the granulars to the late season fungicide application nutrients. I have a bit of a cold, so if I sound short breath or start breaking into a sweat, it's because I have a cold. So my apologies. No. See? See, this is the kind of service you get with robots. <laughs> anyway, so this is the company. That's the now most of you or some of you might have seen these people. This is Jared Chambers, he's the president of the company. Randy Davidge, he's our guy in Manitoba, and also our national sales manager. Barry Lutton in Alberta. Paul Zimmer with Florentine Bioscience. Jason Chick out of Ontario. And our research and development guys, the PhDs. And myself, and we have a Frenchman in Quebec. ATP, everything we do revolves around the R3 management system. Okay, so this is not specific to soybeans, but this is plant nutrition in general. We have pulse products and cereal products. So anyway, everything is re related around the R3 management system based on the BBCH <coughs> scale. Have you guys ever heard of the BBCH scale? Anyone? Okay, except for Rob and Tracy Preet in the back. Has anyone else heard of the BBCH scale? Have you guys ever used it? How many of you know the product Odyssey? Yes? How many of you sprayed Odyssey? On which crop? Peas. What does it tell you on the label? When you spray Odyssey on your peas, when should you apply it? When shouldn't you apply it? <laughs> Just before you go to the lake. How many of you spray Odyssey? And when do you spray it? You're not asking me, so I'm asking you. When are you spraying Odyssey? When do you spray Odyssey normally? Isn't that before the five or six node stage? Why do you think that is? Brilliant. You know what that is? That's the BBCH scale. Telling you the growth stage of that crop, if you use this herbicide past this specific growth stage, you can actually kill it. You can influence nodulation. So most of you have used the BBCH scale. Whether it's Roundup, whether it's Puma on cereals, or any one of the Liberty Centurion, you've used the BBCH scale. You just didn't know it. So anyway, we've taken this scale, which is the growth stage indicator for every crop, and divided it into the production of the roots, the reproductive phases, and the ripening phases. Any questions so far? Let's keep this interactive. If you have questions, please stop me. And if you want to call bullshit, then call it. But just tell me. Anyway, so from the R3 management system, we get the chemtrition platform where we specifically want to add nutrients with chemistries. And from the chemtrition platform, we get the pinwheels. Okay, I gave you two pinwheels, and just to show you how these wheels work. Uh, two wheels, canola and wheat. Which one do you want to use? Wheat, let's take the wheat wheel. You'll see there's a little dial in front. You see this? Turn it to where it says, grow stage. Zero, zero on the outside seed. Are you all there? What does it say there in terms of nutrient requirements? Seed treatment. And the nutrients are zinc, phosphorus, manganese, and copper. So you treat your seed, you plant the seed. When you get to growth stage 13 to 15 on a cereal plant, that is called the three to five leaf stage. Those are the essential nutrients required at that growth stage. That is the product that's gonna give you those nutrients. So looking at this wheel, here's another stupid question maybe. What is the application rate of Odyssey? Oh. The 
Oh. I don't remember. Come on. 40 acres a case. How many of you grow canola? What's the application rate of Centurion? What's that? 40 acres. So what's that, 1.32 liters an acre something? What's the application rate of glyphosate as a pre-seed burn down? A liter. A liter an acre. What's the application rate of zinc and the timing? <laughs> What's the application rate of timing of zinc? <laughs> application rate of timing of copper, boron, manganese, magnesium. So this is, this is kind of where I sometimes get into trouble. The chemical companies have done a great job in training you how to kill stuff. But in terms of growing stuff, we need to start focusing on nutrients. You know, this, is, this is our attempt, is this wheel. This wheel will tell you exactly when zinc is required in that crop and at what grow stage. So you can take this wheel, walk into your wheat field, see I'm at grow stage 30, turn the wheel, and it will tell you which nutrients are required. Does that help? Is that, isn't that amazing? You guys have a book, this stick, on herbicides. You know it back to front. You know the rotations and the mixing orders. But when it comes to these things, and I'm not kicking you in the teeth, I'm just, I'm just making a statement. When it comes to nutrients, we know N, P, K, and S, and that's about it. So we need to start looking at these things. Anyway, so from this wheel, we will get the ATP Nutrition app, which should be available sometime in May. This is what it looks like. I'll, I'll quickly run through this. This is the first page, then, sorry. <coughs> Based on your selection, in this case, we picked canola. It will, there's the wheel. You turn the wheel to the grow stage you want. And at this case, we stopped at grow stage 31, which is bolting in canola. And it tells you that those are the essential nutrients at that grow stage. Not just NPK and S, but also magnesium, sulfur, boron, and molybdenum. So you pick that grow stage. And we'll tell you exactly what is happening at that growth stage in that canola plant, the critical nutrients, and it will list those nutrients. Now, if you want to go pick on boron, it takes you to boron, explaining the role of boron in that plant at that stage, some of the symptoms, the tanks mixed, excuse me, <coughs> the tank mix compatibilities and with all other stuff. Explains everything about boron. The other thing this will do, depending on your crop type, it will make a recommendation if you are seeing deficiency symptoms. Is it young leaves or old leaves? Based on your answer, is it chlorosis, necrosis, or are the leaves deformed? If it's deformed, is it wilted, weak stem, or green veins? And based on your answers, the app will make a prediction saying you need to look at these four nutrients. And then takes you back to the nutrient, explaining the deficiency and the label, application rates, all that kind of stuff. The uptake and removals on barley. Any questions about the app? It's not available yet. Apple is doing their thing with it. So we should have it one of the days, one of these days. Hang on. This is that slide showing that the impact of biotic stresses versus abiotic. The yellow bar, that's the impact of weeds on crop production. The red is abiotic. That's mother nature. That's nutrients. We focus 90% of our time on the yellow bars and forget to look at these. Sorry, you're not kicking in the teeth. Perhaps I know, but I do want to show that. How many of you do soil samples? Hands up. How many of you do soil samples? I'm going to pick on someone else. You do soil samples? You do? Of course. Okay. What do you do with the results? I give them to Tracy. <laughs> Tracy? <laughs> Tracy, what does he do when you give him the, the recommendation? The really? <coughs> really? 
Okay, I'm going to, well, okay, this is my understanding of soil samples in Canada, is you do the soil test. Tracy goes out there, he does the cores, and, the, and he gets back, and he gets the results, and he gives you the interpretation, and this is normally what it looks like. And then he tells you, you need 150 pounds of N, 60 pounds of phosphate, 80 pounds of potassium, and what do you guys do? That ain't going to happen. Give me 45, 16, the hell with the potash, we got lots of it, and some sulfur. Yeah, let's go. Am I, I'm not, am I correct? Okay. <laughs> That's tongue in cheek. The reason why I bring that up is you do soil tests. You go through the first step. We have to do the soil test to see what's available in the soil. It's, cut, it's tough to know where you're going if you don't know where you started. So the soil test will give you that information. And this is normally what it looks like. So depending on what you are growing, most guys will look after NPK and maybe sulfur if he's growing canola or mustard. The purpose behind nutritional products, specialty nutrients, is nutritional agronomy looking after all 17 essential nutrients, not just NPK and S. So what's the bottom line? Soil samples are critical to determine <coughs> levels in the soil. Plant tissue tests can pinpoint specific nutrient deficiencies. Rob mentioned manganese earlier, especially in soybeans. Once a nutrient deficiency is noticed, it's already had an impact on the yield. And treat the cause, not the symptoms. So the first rule of plant nutrition is Liebig's law of minimum, also known as the barrel theory. You guys have seen this, you know this. Yes? Yes? <laughs> the second rule is the rule of relative maximum, saying an abundance of one nutrient in the soil will impact the uptake of all other nutrients. In Saskatchewan, we have lots of potassium in our soil. Is that correct? So we don't need potassium. What else do we have in our soils that, that we have an abundance of? Keep going. No, but yeah, but keep going. <laughs> okay, there's 17. Let's keep Magnesium. It's great to say we have a ton of uh, potash in the soil, but we also have loads and loads and tons and tons of magnesium tying up that potassium. Which brings us to Mulder's chart that says where we have high levels of magnesium, it will enhance the uptake of phosphorus, but negatively impact the uptake of potassium. So when you do the soil sample, you have to look at your K to magnesium ratios to determine whether you need potash or not. <coughs> the soil sample might say you have an abundance, but if the magnesium's tying it up, you might have to do a little bit more. Um, so the system's approach to nutrition, not specific to soybeans only, but all crops. The system's approach is something that I can recommend to you without knowing anything about your agronomy. I can recommend pre-seed, relief, and fortify at certain growth stages without knowing anything about your deficiencies or sufficiencies. But if we want to get specific into specific nutrients, then we have to look at the planned approach to some of these nutrients. So the system of the system's approach when it comes to pre-seed is a seed nutrient dressing basically to get your crop out of the ground as soon as possible. Formulated using nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, zinc, and manganese. I'm not going to get into all the science, but it is a seed nutrient dressing, phosphate, zinc, and manganese, except for the pulse seed treatments. We need to activate the rhizosphere, the little piece of dirt around the root. That's where the uptake of nutrients occur. And for that reason, we ammoniated the product so we get better uptake of manganese, iron, and zinc. The importance of zinc in the seed. How many of you have seen this slide before? Except for Tracy, perhaps. You've seen this. You want to explain this? No. Okay. <laughs> we, we need between 40 and 60 parts per million of zinc in our seeds for good germination and vigor. In Western Canada, the average is between 17 and 30 parts per million. Zinc is non-negotiable in most of our pre-seed products. Because zinc drives the production of the hormone auxins that drives the roots. More zinc, more auxins, more auxins, more roots. In this case, low zinc levels, the coleoptile in the shoot, nothing happens, where we stimulated it to a 61 parts per million 
you can see that it's ready to go. A visual representation of that is seed with low zinc gives us this response, and where we added the pre-seed cocktail, that same crappy seed gave us this response. Manganese. Rob, you mentioned manganese. The importance of manganese as a structural component in the seed. Low, for vegetative growth, a visual response would look something like this. Can you guys see the line in the middle? Can you? Right there. This was, <laughs> this was done in England. Anyway, so this is untreated seed treated. That's the difference manganese makes on the seed, that little bit of manganese. So I'll go through these quickly. Again, the purpose of pre-seed is get the seed out of the ground as quickly as possible and grow the roots. Are we, in terms of this season, are we ahead or behind in terms of seeding from last year? <laughs> any, any guesses? Are you guys thinking we, we're behind? Some guys are saying we're right on time. What do you think? Yet. What's that? They haven't started yet. Well, so the, the indication is that we might be about two weeks behind, maybe three weeks from last year. So the, the, again, the purpose of pre-seed is get your crop out of the ground. So I can see this being almost a necessity in a year like this year. Anyway, untreated check versus treated. You can see it. Again, zinc drives the roots. Okay, if anyone wants to call bullshit on this one, I wouldn't blame you. Any questions? Are you getting the yield data? On this? Yeah. I'll get into it, yes. So this is some pictures I took last year. Last year we had a fairly wet spring. Purpose of pre-seed, grow the roots irregardless of weather. Check versus treated. This is Cruiser Max cereals, Cruiser Max cereals plus pre-seed, and the same thing. This is on oats, untreated check, Cruiser Max cereals, Cruiser Max plus pre-seed. That's that same field two weeks later. It takes about three to five days for a cereal leaf to develop. This versus that, we were about two weeks ahead on this side. You can actually see it there. Application rates, don't worry about that too much. Do not treat directly into your cedars. It will bridge. Okay, that's in a truck, so imagine. Now, getting closer to soybeans. We have a product called Pre-Seed Pulse. And I just learned last week that we will have a product called pre-seed soy. The application rate normally is 3 milliliters per kilogram of seed. In this case, it will be 1 milliliter per kilogram of seed. It has all the attributes of the pre-seed cereal and canola, with the exception of the heavy metals like zinc, manganese, and copper. And the reason for that is we don't want to kill the inoculants or the rhizobium. So molybdenum and nickel, magnesium and calcium, CFI compliant, and the whole purpose of this product is to increase or speed up nodulation. So on peas, this is the response. I mean, that's as, this is kind of what we want to see. And that's the result of cobalt, molybdenum, and nickel. So how can those zinc in the lentils? In the lentils? Yeah. I've heard <coughs> Lentils? Do you inoculate the lentils? Yeah. Is that why? Is there zinc in? No, like in your, your say you eliminated the zinc in your... Yeah, we, we, yeah. Metals kill rhizobium. Yeah, heavy metals, zinc, manganese, and copper kills rhizobium. So there's, in the pulse primer, in the pulse pre-seed, there is no heavy metals. It's calcium, whoops, calcium, magnesium, nickel, cobalt, and molybdenum. No metals. Sorry, was that the question? Yeah, I guess. Was that the answer? <laughs> So the zinc actually, I've heard it kills the, or it has an effect on the inoculant, but you're saying the zinc actually kills the rhizobium? The rhizobium inoculant, yes. Sorry, I'm, I'm so, dying. But if you, if you place your inoculant not with, well, your granular inoculant, not on the seed, okay, if, if you're not using zinc now? Yes, if you're not using, <coughs> the rule of thumb is, Zinc and rhizobium don't go together. But if you're using granular inoculants and there's going to be a bit of separation, you should be fine. Because this stuff is on the seed and your inoculants should be... If there's separation, you should be okay. I just don't want to stand up here and tell you, yeah, it's fine, and then have a train wreck. Yeah. 
So the short answer is don't put heavy metals with inoculants. Yeah. But I know some guys who've done it and they swear by it. So go ahead. I'm giving you the label. How do you get coverage with three or even one milliliter of product per kilogram? Per kilogram of seed. You add a little bit of water to it. <laughs> or lots of water. I don't know. you got to cut it. It, it is, yes. So if you are doing seed treatment, you, but still, so the question is, is it the one milliliter or the, 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 well, both are the active? Very, very small rates. Yeah. Now, again, we don't need, these things are called micronutrients. We don't need buckets full. We need trace amounts. Like I showed that one, that one slide was nine parts per million. <coughs> Putting on that little bit of zinc in the seed gave us a massive response. As I said, we don't need buckets and buckets. We just need the slightest amount. So I got to speed up. I got what 20 minutes left, yeah? yeah. Okay, I'll 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 be quick. Uh, who asked the question about the yield responses? Uh, this is where we put the the seed, the pre-seed on the seed, and we certainly made a big difference impact in terms of zinc in the seed, in terms of compatibility with as far as the vigor is concerned, with chemistries. Out of 10, one being the lowest, nine being the highest vigor. The Czech scored a 3.2, Raxel Cruiser Max, and Pre-Seed in terms of a vigor response, a great response. But where we combined the chemistry with the Pre-Seed, we got an even greater response. Now again, not saying any one of these is better than the other one, just saying that this is what we tested. When we looked at the yields for that specific trial, Raxel Cruiser Max Pre-Seed did a pretty good job, but again, Cruiser Max plus Pre-Seed a great response. Not saying one is better than the other, it's just what we saw. In terms of root length, Liberty versus Roundup Ready, massive response. Do you have a question? I was just giving you back. Certainly. Yeah. Which one? Yeah. Who do you work for, Syngenta? <laughs> can I go, can I go, go on? Yeah. Fifty-five over fifty-one. Just using the pre-seed is about two bushels. Anyway, I, I don't want to sell you on the bushels. I want to sell you on the principle of nutrients on the seed. The seed nutrient dressing has a benefit. If I tell you you're going to get fifteen bushels yield increase and you only get seven, are you guys going to be mad at me? I guess you are. Yes. If I promise you 15 and I only give you 7, you're going to be pissed off, yeah. Okay, we'll get there. But if I promise you 3 and you get 7, I'm the bloody hero. So, so you'll get 2 bushels. Okay, just a summary then. In the soil, how many of you do soil micronutrients, either granular or liquid? You do it. Uh, manganese and soybeans, you know, quite, quite important. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this stuff. The platinum and the rough and tough, the zinc EDTAs, the copper EDTAs, manganese EDTAs, goes in with liquid fertilizer, and then we have the granular products that are lignosulfonate products. It's 100% sulfate-based, lignin complex, ammonium sulfate, blah, blah, blah. It does a great job because it's only a 5% copper and a 9% zinc, or 10% zinc. It weighs the same as 1152, in other words, 56 pounds per cubic foot. So if you put the stuff in a blend, it's not going to settle to the bottom, it's not going to flow to the top. It weighs the same as 1152, and because it's a low analysis, 5% or a 10% product, you get double the granules for every pound of product, compared to what's being used in the market currently, whether it's an oxysulfate or zinc sulfate. Oxides are insoluble. Oxides 0.16 milligrams versus a zinc sulfate at 57.7 grams per 100 milliliters. So this is just showing that the more soluble a nutrient is in the soil, the better response you get. Less than 30% solubility, that's a response, response on corn. Higher than 60%, that's the response. So it's not just what you put in, it's also the form of nutrient that you put in. Zinc oxysulfates are immobile, sulfates are mobile, lignosulfonates are 100% mobile. In terms of root interception, obviously it increases. Relief. Okay. 
Are there any questions about the proceed? I'm speeding through this thing, so are there any questions so far? Did I lose you? Yes. Everything's good? Brilliant. Uh, I will get to some more pictures at the end where we actually did the systems approach, the pre-seed plus the relief plus the fortify, and you can see how it, how it evolved. <coughs> the purpose of pre-seed is, as Rob said, get it out of the ground. We are not replacing soil fertility. This is not addressing a deficiency in the soil. This is merely putting nutrients on that seed. Get the seed out of the ground. Now, if you're going to be seeding in... Here's another stupid question. When do you seed? As soon as, as soon as That's the right answer. I've done this so many times. When do you seed? And the guy says, second week in April, fourth, fourth week in August. You know, No, you seed as soon as you can get in. Now, most guys go out there, they measure the soil temperature, and they seed anyway. So if your soil is going to be at zero to five degrees Celsius, and you've got that little seed sitting there freezing its butt off, you need to do something to get it out of the ground. And again, it's got nothing. What's the first thing a seed does when you put it in the ground? Does it photosynthesize or does it respirate? Respirate. That means taking on water starts to breathe. It starts to dissolve all the nutrients in the seed. So it starts feeding the embryo and the embryo starts growing. That needs to happen even if the soil is at zero to five degrees Celsius. And this is what the pre-seed does. It kickstarts that process. Anyway, foliar applications. This is all with the herbicides. Our seed, our yield potential is 200 bushels. When do we start losing yield? What's that? It's like day three there, by the chart. You start losing yield as soon as you stick that seed in the ground. That seed has a yield potential of 200. As soon as you stick it in, Mother Nature and the bugs and the wind and the moisture and the chemistries and everything starts taking away from yield. Once we've lost the yield, it's gone. We cannot get it back. We can't go from 200 to 60 back to 200 again. But what we can, what we can try to do is to stop the bleeding. Try and minimize the loss. We want it anyway. So the benefits of a foliar application with a herbicide... It increases the crop safety of that herbicide. It's compatible. Each product complements a well-balanced nutrient program, aids the plant with additional nutrition during peak nutrient demand periods, and can correct a nutritional deficiency. So if you don't know what you have, if you add a product like Relief or any one of these multi-nutrient products, it will address some of these deficiencies. The importance of phosphate. As a foliar application, seed formation promotes early root growth and hastens maturity. That's what we want with phosphate. Am I too quick? Do... Am I losing you guys? Are you guys falling asleep? Tracy? Yeah? <laughs> that guy's texting. Anyway, so... So relief. In relief, we have relief cereal, relief canola, and relief pulse for your soybeans, for your pulses. We also have some proprietary labels that we make for certain people like the AGSI power plants or the Hoodies Energize products or Doug McRae's Foss FX. So we don't just do our ATP products, we also custom manufacture. If Rob Garland has a requirement for a specific nutrient blend, we can make it for him. Anyway, what happens what is being determined at three to five leaf stage in your cereal crop? What is being determined? Yield. Yield. What is it you do to your cereal crop at three to five leaf stage? Spray. You spray it with a herbicide. What do you think that plant's thinking? This plant's sitting in moisture. It's got all the nutrients it wants. It's happy. It's thinking, I'm going to give this guy 60 bushels. You drive in there with a herbicide. What's that little seedling thinking now? Oh, shit. 20, if he's lucky. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the herbicide impacts your yield, and it impacts this. At three to five leaf stage, that head is sitting right there. It's the first node under the soil. There it is. So this is a basal node. Just on the onset of tillering, there's your head. What's being determined at that growth stage is the spikelets and the florets. 
This is what they look like. So every spikelet has between three to six florets. So if you start off with four florets per spikelet, and you spray a herbicide, and you knock off one of those florets, what was your yield decrease percentage-wise? 25%. By, if you had four florets, you end up with three with the herbicide, you just knocked off 25% of your yield. That's all it takes. Can we get it back? No. So the purpose of a foliar application, like Rob said earlier, is to minimize the effect of herbicide, minimize the effect of the environment. Now, whether it's canola or peas or pulses or soybeans, it doesn't matter. Every herbicide has an impact on your crop. How do you guys measure the, the success of a herbicide? Yeah, yeah, you've got a clean field. Have you ever measured the impact of the herbicide on your yield? How do you measure the success of my products? By yield and return on investment. If I'm going to spend $7, am I going to get $40 back? Otherwise, eh. Okay, so guys go in there, they spray glyphosate, they spray Puma, they spray whatever they spray, and I have whoop de doo, I have a clean field. But you just knock five bushels off your yield. That's for, your sorry. The Yes. Yes. It safens it. Sorry. Yeah. So it's a necessary evil. I'm not against herbicides. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying we measure the success of a herbicide by, wow, I have a clean field. We did a study on Roundup Ready canola where we actually lost a bushel and a half on Roundup Ready crops spraying it with Roundup. So it does have an impact. So anything we can do to minimize that. You look like you have a question. No? A word? So I'm not criticizing herbicide spray. Yes, it's a necessary evil. But if you can add something to minimize the effect, you stop this from happening. This is in Willow Bunch. There's the line. This is treated. This is check. You can see by spraying relief with the herbicide, we didn't delay maturity. This thing flowered like it was nothing wrong versus the check. Chris Bodry, Nakem, Saskatchewan, check. This is pre-seed. This is pre-seed plus relief. This is a lady, um, Colleen Murphy, with Winland Ag out of, Walt, uh, out of Delmas. They had hail on June the 28th, rain on the 29th, they sprayed on the 30th, they got eight bushels over the 20. By just minimizing the effect of the environment, and we all know with canolas who are today cha-ching. In terms of a yield response, 48, a fifth, that's a two bushel with boron. I'm, I'm going through this quickly. So... Relief is there to minimize the effect of the herbicide. It speeds up the metabolism. It minimizes that impact. So, specific nutrients. If, we, if you phone me and say, hey, I have a manganese or a copper deficiency, what can I do? I would most probably recommend any one of these products. So this is getting more specific. And the last but not least is fortify. So you've seeded the crop. You spray the crop. What happens after you spray the crop normally? What do you guys normally do? Go to the lake. To the lake. <laughs> yes. Then you come back. And then, oh, now it's flag leaf stage. Now it's flowering stage. Now we've got to spray fungicides. And for that reason, we've developed the Fortify. Again, canola pulse cereal. And also in the pulses. Where's the pulse one? I would also recommend a bit of calcium. But anyway, these are the products that goes on with your fungicide at fungicide stage. And this is why. The formulations contain high levels of phosphates and phosphites. I'm not going to get into that. Again, check versus treat it. This is just, again, speeding up maturity. Everything you do up to flag leaf stage or flowering stage is growing that crop. Everything from flag leaf and flowering onwards is protecting the crop. The fortify is specifically for that, protecting what you've grown. This is Terry Eberhardt. Uh, this is the check. You see it this way, spray it this way. There's a bit of a dark cloud there. That's the check, and this is a treated using Fortify with his fungicide. In terms of fungicidal efficacy, the Fortify containing phosphites gives us a fairly good uh, fungicidal control. Is that untreated? Is, that, is there a fungicide on the untreated? Um, there was a fungicide in this, and there was a fungicide plus a fortify in this, same as this one. 
and this is soybeans in Iowa. That's the check, and that's the treated. Again, late season. In terms of yield responses, <laughs> in terms of yield responses, check four to five on its own did a great job, and then thought again a, a late season fungicide application with a nutrient product gave us these responses. And in, in no way am I saying that this one or this one is better than that one. I'm just saying this is what we tested because this is what's being used in the field. So I'm not making any claims about which one's better. These are some of the responses we saw. Our field program, I think this is a summary, 68 over 65 on oats. And then on wheat, the summary, half liter to one liter application rate gives us the same response but where we went with two liters we actually cause phytotoxicity. So do not apply four to five, if you are going to use it, more than two liters an acre. You will fry your crop. The reason why we have these two rates, if the guy, because it contains a phosphite, if you are going to spray a fungicide, add half a liter of four to five. If you're not spraying a fungicide because of the phosphites, we would recommend one liter to the acre. So I'll speed up quickly. Okay. Okay, five minutes and I'm done. Win and Egg up in Waldheim, Saskatchewan, did a trial. And we never asked for this. They just did it to see what would happen. So we tested ATP versus UAP versus Alpine versus Omex. Now, again, this is on cereal. My apologies. But it was to see what the systems of approach, nutri the nutrient or the systems approach of nut nutrition, what that would look like compared to what's being used in the market. So first one we tested was Awaken ST versus Black Label Zinc, and that scored a 62 bushel. The check in this case was 40, 54 bushels was the check. So Awaken, Black Label did a pretty good job. The Omex stuff, not so good. And where we used pre-seed, relief, and fortify as a systems approach, 65 bushels. So we got 12 bushels over the check. What's the next obvious question after this slide? Yeah, how much is it? Yes, thank you. <laughs> if you do pre-seed, relief, and fortify on your cereal, all three of these, it's going to cost you $18 roughly for all three applications, not per application. So the systems approach on all three of these is $18. If you had to do this approach on canola, it would cost you $13 an acre for all three. That's one bushel. We can break this down individually, but as a systems approach, that's what we see. Okay. How much time do I have? Am I done? I got, I got something. Are you guys interested in water quality? Are you guys seeing more and more issues with plugging nozzles and sprayers and cleaning out booms and stuff? No? Sure. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, so understanding hard water, just quickly, and again, we sell the product, so that's why I'm talking about it. The most expensive spray is the one that fails to accomplish the goal it was intended for. You know, you can buy something for a dollar an acre. If, if it doesn't work, it's too much. Can you guys see a difference in those two samples? Can you guys see a difference? I did this once, and the guy said, well, there's a little blue dot, and there's another blue dot. <laughs> Serious? Anyway. You can't really see a difference, but we had these water tested. We had them tested for hardness, and we found that the one on the left is considered soft, and the one on the right at 200 parts per million or higher cations. So what happens when you add a herbicide into spray water, especially crappy spray water? You'll see almost, this is a good spray water, the soft water, the hard water, almost immediately almost immediately you can see a precipitate forming. Now this is glyphosate, using glyphosate with this crappy water. How many of you have seen this before? Almost immediately you see stuff forming in your water, haven't you? And then if we leave it another few minutes, what, it, what is actually happening is, okay, this case glyphosate, iron, calcium, magnesium, free radicals or cations in your spray water attaches with the glyphosate component, forming gypsum. This is what's happening. This is why it's, so it's forming a precipitate, and it's a crystal. And if you leave it long enough, that's what it looks like. This is a sample I took out of Delmas this year, and you can see there's sludge in the bottom. Anyway, 
So if you had to spray glyphosate with that crappy water, this is going to be your response with glyphosate. If you use the good water, that's what you'll see. So Enforce can reverse that process. So there we add the Enforce, and within a few minutes, we've actually broken those bonds, and we are back to good quality water. If you guys do water testing, what do you normally look for? How many of you have done that? You've done it. What do you look for in the soil in the water test? pH and hardness. Okay. What else? Well, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm here to tell you that hardness is one thing to look at, but it's a very bad indicator of how good the water is. The number you need to look for is this one, the TDS. It stands for Total Dissolvable Solids. That's the calciums, the magnesiums, the ions, aluminums floating around, tying up your chemistry. You need to look at this number, and the other one is hardness. So I want you to remember that 358. So we've taken those numbers, punched it into our little calculator, and it will show us that our in in inactivation potential is 150, so we need 50 milliliters per five gallons of spray water to neutralize that effect. So just an acid? No, it's not just an acid. No, it's not just an acidifier, no. Here's another sample. This is a town of Waldheim. We did the same thing, total dissolvable salts versus the hardness, 358, pretty good. We did it again, 239, again, this guy will need 50 milliliters per five gallons of water. But here's a guy, this is his dugout. Look at that. 2,102, 254. In terms of hardness, it's pretty much the same as the town water from Wild Diamond Lead. Not bad. But total dissolvable salts, so we punch those numbers into the calculator. 489, this guy will need 100 milliliters per five gallons of water. Okay, so please, the reason why we're doing this, I'm getting too many phone calls on a Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock, saying, you plug my nozzles, come clean my spray tank. A guy phones me and he's, he's, he's pissed off. I mean, he's fuming. So I start asking all the questions. Tell me about the mixing order. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. So eventually I said, tell me about your water source. He says, I get it from the ditch. I said, which ditch? He said, next to the highway. I said, that's it. Conversation's over. If, now you guys go, oh, really? You guys do it? Because you don't want to go back to the yard to fill up every time. I know you guys do it. I'm not criticizing but please, if you're going to do that, add something to your water to, to, stop these phone, <laughs> to stop these phone calls. You'll do yourself a favor. Are there any questions? What's that cost? So, depending on your application rate, it's going to be up or down. But we, a standard application rate would be about one liter per 100 gallons of water. And that's going to be anywhere from about 70 to 90 cents an acre. If you're putting an Otis in your spray tank, it's going to cost you $800 in that spray tank. The cheapest thing you put in your spray tank is water. The thing that has the biggest impact on your efficacy of that herbicide is water. So please, have a look. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, I just want to go back to the, like, the reason you have these cereals. I have three to five. What's it do to your herbicide then? How do you mean? Uh, does it speed it up? Does it heat it up? Yes. Yes. Okay, so the question is, if we add relief to herbicides, will it heat up the herbicide? Will it give it the herbicide uh, a boost? Yes, it will. Do you, so, do you adjust your rates of your herbicide? No, well? no. So you don't have to worry about it? No. So the reason, okay, so it will speed up the efficacy or it will heat up or boost your herbicide. And, and the other question I normally associate or that comes with that question is, what about the weed? It's also going to speed up the metabolism in the weed. But that herbicide was designed to kill that weed, so we get quicker and better kill.